Good morning, Promise Church, and welcome to our Sunday online experience. We are so glad that you are here with us today, and we want to ask you to join with us digitally in other ways as well to communicate. So what I have in front of me is uh, I have our promisechurch.community website, and I uh, will encourage you to use one of your uh, one of your devices to go to your Promise Church community website where all of our service information is happening, and you can check click the Get Connected, and you'll see a spot to put in your information and let us know that you're here with us. It allows you to be part of our community where we're able to communicate with you and talk to you about announcements and how things are going and what things are coming up, as well as it's an invitation to join our online conversation that is happening on Slack. And uh, our entire church community is on Slack right now, and you are welcome to join us by filling this out, and we'll get you a Slack invite to our Slack channel right now. Um, so we pray that you enjoy the service and, uh, and know that God is with us. Good morning, Promise Church. What an honor it is to come before you today and lead you in worship. I want to take this moment and just remind you that you can feel 100% comfortable to worship in your home. We want you to engage with us this morning. Michaela and I, we're just going to be worshiping. We're going to be leading you in worship. And, you know, this is one of the best things we can do as a community. So we're going to lift our voices. We're going to celebrate God this morning. And so why don't you join us? Let's, let's go. Let's get into it. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah, and heaven comes to fight for me. Oh, sing this with us. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar, up from the ashes, hope will arise. The King is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. i 
every breath that I am made, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. Thank you. 
thank you, God. God, we worship you this morning. We thank you for your faithfulness. You are so good, God, and we, we lift you high at this time, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us, Promise. Good morning, Promise Kids. Notice anything different this morning? Things are a little bit different here, a little darker. We're gonna talk about something light today. In John chapter eight, verse 12, it says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Have you ever gotten up in the middle of the night and you had to go downstairs to get a drink and it's all dark in your house? Sometimes you walk into the wall or stub your toe, walk over a toy that you forgot to pick up. Those are all obstacles that are in our way. It's not very fun to walk into obstacles. Sometimes it hurts. Well, Jesus is telling us that he's the light of the world. That means he brings light. He shows us the way to go. You know, God's presence is our protection and he shows us which way we need to go. And when he shines his light, we can see everything in our way that we need to avoid and the things that we need to go closer to. Jesus is our protection and he is the light that shows us where to go. This week, we are going to make paper lanterns just like this. I'm gonna email your moms and dads all the instructions on how to make a paper lantern like this. You guys can decorate it with jewels or glitter, stickers, whatever you want. You guys are gonna make paper lanterns to represent that Jesus is the light of the world. You want a challenge for next week, I bet, don't you guys? Well, here's your challenge. Next week, I want you all to come prepared, sitting on the couch in your comfy clothes and a big bowl of popcorn. Think you can do that next week? I'll be in my comfies with a bowl of popcorn too. Look for the emails, moms and dads, with the instructions for this paper lantern. Remember that Jesus is the light of the world and he is our protection. Have a great week, guys. Bye. At this point of our service, we're taking up our normal offering. And at Promise Church, we do this every single week as an important part of our act of worship towards God. And in such a time as this, it's really important that we offer our thanksgiving. Philippians 4 says, in everything by prayer, and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And when we're offering up our thanksgiving to God, what I would really like us to focus on is how we have still been blessed. For many of us, you know, we're still, we're still blessed even though the world is changing around us and, and we're isolated in our, in our homes, we are still blessed. And I just want us to take a moment and be thankful for that. And in that thanksgiving, we offer up uh, our worship to God. If you are planning on giving today, you are able to give on promisechurch.community and the green tab is our giving tab. Um, please make sure that you select the drop down for Promise Church, otherwise all the funds that you give goes to our parenting organization, uh, Willowdale Pentecostal Church. And, uh, and so thank you very much for that today. I'm going to pray a prayer of thanksgiving and I just ask you to join with us right now. Our Father, I thank you so much for everything that you have given us. Even in a time when some of the things that we hold to as stabilizers in our life, it, life is taken away. God, you provide us with everything we need. Your word says that, that you are our provider. And so we look around our house, we look around at our family right now, and we say thank you for everything that you have done. We offer up what we can to you today, and we say thank you for providing us with everything we need, and we know that you are a good God. In Jesus' name, amen. Every week at Promise Church, we do a spiritual practice together. 
And this morning we're going to do uh, a practice called Lectio Divina. And it's a practice that Christians have been doing for centuries. Uh, it's a practice where we dig into God's Word and we, we ask ourselves questions that allow us to dig deep into what God is saying to us today. And so this morning as we're gathered together in our living rooms, and I'm here in my living room this morning, we're, uh, we're going to do this practice together. And it's a practice that you can do uh, with your, your family that's with you there right now, or you know, if you're on your own, you can do this on your own and, and share messages on Slack. But this is also something that you can do uh, on your own. And, and we encourage you to, uh, to read the Bible and to do this sometimes to, to deepen your understanding of what God is saying to us. So this morning, we're going to read this passage three different times. And each time, I'm going to ask a different question. And so the first time I read this passage, and we intentionally don't tell you what it is, just because we want you to listen to the words and, and to hear what God is saying, instead of kind of getting bogged down in, you know, oh, what does that particular word mean? Or, uh, you know, why, why is that phrase like that? It, it's, it's an exercise that we want you to just connect with it and hear what God is saying. So as I read this passage, the first time I want you to just think about what is, what is actually happening in this passage. And immediately he, that is Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was by this time a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So take a couple minutes to discuss with the people around you or, or type a message into Slack saying, just to, what is happening in this passage? I'm going to read the passage a second time, and this time, as I read, I want you to consider this question. Where do I find myself in this passage today? Where do I see myself? Is there a character I relate to? Is, this, is there a situation I relate to? Where do you see yourself in this this morning? Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid 
And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So take a couple minutes to uh, discuss what it, where do you find yourself in this passage this morning. This third time, as I read the passage, what I'd like you to consider is what is God saying to me this morning? Through this story, what, is, what are the words that God is saying to you? Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to, uh, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Take a couple minutes to type a response into Slack. What is God saying to you this morning?
Let's pray. So God, we thank you. We thank you that your word, words that were written by people thousands of years ago are still active. They are still teaching us. They are still revealing you to us today. And God, as we dig into the, into the scriptures, we, as we seek to know you through your word, God, we pray that you would continue to reveal yourself to us. That through this practice, that we would see more and more of your heart. And the God, that you would continue to make your word come alive to us as we read it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for participating in this spiritual discipline together with us this morning. I think that we live in a crazy world. It's, it's this strange type of reality that we find ourselves in, right? Like, I think it's been 11 or 12 weeks. I can't even count anymore how long this weirdness is happening. I mean, thank God that we're, that we're progressing towards getting back to some sort of normalcy in life. But we live in a crazy world. And in some ways, there are elements of our society that are at risk. They're, they're kind of falling apart. And let me explain that. I'm not a doomsday sayer. I'm not, a, uh, I'm not an alarmist per se, but I want to explain it as we get into today. And I, I, I want to thank you as a family group for being part of the Promised Church family, for engaging with who we are and continuing to work through this. This was not our plan. You know, when we lost our space at Chris Hadfield, um, that was not our decision. That was a decision made by the government of Ontario and by the Simcoe County District School Board and, and closed our permits. Um, it's just something that happened inside this pandemic. But you guys have walked with us in this crazy world, in this time that it's just a little bit weird, a lot weird. It's a lot weird. And, uh, and so thank you for your patience. Thank you for being involved. Uh, thank you for, for being a part of Promise Church. Thank you for commenting on Slack. And maybe some people right now are going to write, you're welcome. Um, this is such a crazy time. And, you know, it's, it's a crazy time and there are elements of our society that are at risk. And I just want to talk about them because it's going to affect how we prepare for the presence of God. So where are we at risk? Well, um, as a society, we struggle now with the idea of truth. It used to be a philosophical discussion uh, called epistemology, but now it's come into the real life, into what our experiences are as individuals and how we ascertain what is true. And truth is in question these days. You know, Three years ago, four years ago, if we count the campaign, Donald Trump down in the States tagged something that seemed obscure at the time, but he created a hashtag called fake news. And in that, it wasn't that he created this crisis, but he highlighted this crisis of, an under, of a misunderstanding or a not really being clear on how we get to what is true. Oprah had helped out before that when she had talked about our truth, as though truth was fully subjective. And there are elements of truth that are subjective. My experience is not the same as your experience. The way that I'm processing this pandemic is not the same as the way you are processing this, this life adjustment and what's happening. And so there are elements that truth can be subjective in experience. But there are also elements where truth is very important. And as a society, we may be on the verge of what technically would be called an epistemological crisis. It's a crisis as a society that says, how do we determine what is true? How do we determine where we go? We as Christians need to understand our foundation of truth in a really big way. So this is really relevant to how we prepare for the presence of God and what it means for us. So today, that's what we're doing. If we want God's life and God's presence to influence our work, we as a church need to have a foundation of 
why we say what we say is unshakably true. Let me pray. God, as we enter into this idea of truth, it is such a vague idea, yet a very specific idea. It's, it's got subjective reasoning in it as well as, as, as historic reasoning. It's, a, it's an idea that has been grappled with for the centuries, and today we grapple with it in a whole new way. And so, God, I pray that as we prepare for your presence, that we would understand the foundation of our truth, where it is, and how we can access it, and how we can know you, how we can truly be caught up into your presence in a huge and important way. I pray for a blessing on all these church families that have, that have joined us on, online. I pray that you would sustain them, that you would be with them, God, that you would, that you would allow their eyes to see a, a positive future, that your vision and, and the way that your kingdom breaks into this fractured society would become clear to them and that we would be able to continue to move forward as a church in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. John 14, 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said that. And so, what an audacious statement. I mean, that is absolutely huge. How can Jesus, who in our secular worldview would be an individual, one individual, claim such a broad, sweeping, huge statement of truth? How can Jesus even do that? How can he, as one person 2,000 years ago, have a voice that transcends time, that says, I am the truth? I mean, that's a big statement to swallow. It's a big statement to try to wrap our heads around as we are in a place where we don't really understand truth. We need to really get into that. How can we believe that statement today since it seems to have been written by a man about a man? And how can we trust the Bible at all? Really, that's the foundational question that we need to ask. Because the Bible tells us about Jesus, and Jesus is the truth. And so, how do we get the authority to speak of truth? How do we even get there? So, it's really, really important to, to start to grapple with this. And we're going to do it, hopefully, in a very quick sermon. Um, it might be, well, we'll see how it goes. But... It's really important. So let's, let's travel through this together. What Christians believe? We believe uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. It says that all scripture is breathed out by God. And it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All scripture is breathed out by God. So what does it mean? So does it mean that God wrote the scriptures? Yes. Does it mean that men wrote the scriptures? Well, yes. We actually believe in a dual authorship of scripture. We believe that God wrote and people wrote scripture. And God spoke and people recorded, and God acted, and people recorded, and God inspired, and people wrote it down. So we have this dual authorship of Scripture that's really important for us to wrap our heads around. You know, there are some lines of Christianity that say that only God wrote Scripture, and that same line of Christianity would say that the original writing of Scripture was written by God moving the arms of people like a marionette. And that literal understanding of God wrote scripture would be then transitioned down through the human translations, but the best human translation, according to this sect of Christianity, would be the King James Version. And they would be absolutely adamant that God inspired the King James Version as well. Okay, well, the majority of the mainline Christian doctrine and Christian belief doesn't hold to that strict piece because we believe in a dual authorship, a partnership between God and people. And I want to explain how that partnership works, how we get to authority from this strange place. 
So did God write every word of scripture through people? Yes. So here's what we need to know. We need to understand what is good theology. As we get to truth, we have to understand a basis for our study of God. The good theology is only based on God's action. There's nothing that we know about God without God's action. If God didn't do anything, we would not know it. We would not know anything about God. But because God acts, we are able to know God. We are able to see his action. And, uh, and so the Bible becomes, in the broad scale, the Bible becomes the collection of God's actions. The collection of stories, generation after generation, of God's action. Last week I said that the Bible is God's story and the characters in the Bible are the, uh, they're the supporting roles. God is the main character. And that if we read the Bible from that perspective, that God is the main character, then the storyline is God solving the problem of how he reveals himself to people. That's the storyline of scripture. And so when we read scripture with that lens, how does God reveal himself to people? We can start to build good theology. Theology in the past hundred years has been about Um, categorize. It's called systematic theology. We categorize ideas. Here is an idea of God. He is Trinity. Here are all of the scriptures that point to God being Trinity. Bam, done. Trinity theology is here. Okay, so now we have creationism. Here is what we believe about God, and here's what the Bible says. Here it is, right here. Bam, there's our category. And we systemize all of our beliefs. That's systematic theology. More recently, we've actually stepped into a more narrative view of biblical theology, and we call it biblical study. What it is, is the belief that God has been acting through stories to reveal his character, which means to understand it, we have to get involved in the history. What did God do? And that's where we get good theology comes from God's action. When we have the historic story, then we're able to say, this is important for us. Now, that's a really important point, what God did. Because if God does, uh, if, if God were, were to be viewed, we would have to realize that God needs to be viewed through multi-generations, because he is too large to be encapsulated in one generation or one person's experience. He is much too large. So we have to have a multi-generation story of God. Otherwise, God is too small. So God uses generations of people to tell the story one after another. And it's non-contradictory. God's story continues on in a non-contradictory fashion, and as his story continues on, we can see what God is doing. Here's a really interesting piece. In this story of God's action, God foretells what he is going to do. Here's a verse for us to consider. Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the, pro- the prophets. God does nothing without telling it. So what's going on here? Well, think of it when you last went to a pool hall. Maybe you were a young adult. Maybe you were a teenager. Maybe it was yesterday. Well, no, they're closed. And, uh, and so you went to a pool hall and you, you, you set your shot up and, and you just, you take your shot. And lo and behold, three balls go into three different pockets. And you're like, yeah, yeah, that just happened. And your friend who is with you calls fluke. You didn't mean to do that. That was a complete fluke. You didn't mean to make that happen. You just shot and the balls happened to all go in there. Okay, well, sometimes when you play pool, a fluke shot gets called back and it's not valid. God says that he doesn't do anything without first revealing his secrets to his prophets. So not only do we know God through his actions, we can know God through his action of predicting or calling his shot. 
If I'd gone into the pool hall in the same way and I had said, all right, I'm going to hit this ball and that ball is going to hit that ball and that ball is going to hit that ball and they're going to go into these different pockets, then I would have called my shot. And when it actually happened, I would say, I'm amazing. This is what happened. And my friend wouldn't say fluke. My friend would be like, you're amazing. You are amazing at pool. Well, what God has done is he's revealing himself generation after generation and he's calling his shots. He's saying, I'm going to do this, and then he does it. And the first thing we've recognized about God very quickly is we see that God establishes his faithfulness. It's the first character attribute we know about God in the Bible. In, in chronology of the revelation of God, he builds everything on faithfulness. He makes a promise and he fulfills it. This is where the name of our church comes in. It's a promise and it's fulfillment. We get to promise church foreshadowing the fulfillment of God's promises. And so we get this promise fulfillment motif that's happening, that's building this faithfulness of God. God builds his credibility by calling his shots. Okay, vitally important, but let's pause for a second. We need to recap where we are. We are talking about the authority of God as truth. He establishes through generations and he calls his shots to show his faithfulness, to show it's really him. We have a court system right now. We're going to move to the next point. We have a court system right now. And our court system determines whether somebody is guilty or somebody is innocent. That's what happens. We have two major ways in which guilt or innocence is determined. One is through evidence and two is through witnesses. God uses the same thing. In physical evidence, we look to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 12. Deuteronomy 6, 12 is in the Shema, but what it is, is it says, you know, take care lest you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you will fear, in him you will serve, and by his name you will swear. So what we have is we have this idea that, that says, take care to not forget. Israel, right at the beginning of God's re redemption from, from Egypt, these people have been sworn to record the actions of God. Why? Because that's how we know God. God acts generation after generation, and now these people have been sworn to record it. Write it down. God did something. It was awesome. Write it down. Because the generations afterwards must know. Because we have to build our understanding of God. This is progressive revelation. We're building our understanding of God. So in the Pentateuch, the early story of God is told. It's written down. And it takes us all the way back to creation. The Pentateuch, Penta, first five books of the Bible. It takes us all the way back. Okay, so... When we are preparing for the presence of God, we have to find the authority of God in Scripture. And the people of God are now charged with telling the story of God and writing it down. Lest you forget. Later on in history, an army was attacking, was attacking Israel. And Samuel, who at the time was the, was the priest leader of the whole nation of Israel, and, uh, and, he was, and, and it was the Philistine army that was coming in and attacking and God gave them a miraculous victory. We know that God is powerful and he is provider and he is, and he is protector because God gave them a miraculous victory. It's, it's written down. And so in this writing, um, Samuel, in, uh, in 1 Samuel 7, 12, you can look this one up, uh, Samuel set up a stone monument and he called it an Ebenezer because he said that it's till now the Lord has helped us. It's a testimony that this witness, this evidence that God has helped us is right here. God has done something and we are bearing witness to the evidence. This is what's happened. So the whole Bible is the recorded story of God's predicted and faithful fulfillment of his promises and revelation of his character. This is what we're seeing in the Bible. So when we talk about authority... We're talking about carefully written words about God's actions. 
Really, really important. Remembering and marking the acts of God was the practice of the people of Israel. This is the basis and the foundation of what we know. The story they tell is historical. And it's really, really large. So, on top of that, we have the witnesses. And the witnesses are happening in Deuteronomy 17, just a couple couple pages over. Deuteronomy 17, 6 and 7 says, um, On the evidence of two or three witnesses, the one... Uh, who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall first be against him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of the people. So you will purge the evil from your midst. The idea is that you can't just accuse somebody of doing something. There needs to be multiple witnesses backing it up. There needs to be evidence. There needs to be witnesses. This is very early on in the structure in the law structure of the Jewish people. And so we have witnesses establishing truth. In Matthew 18, we have witnesses once again um, talking about how discipline happens. And, and it says you go with witnesses to say that, that uh, something has happened. So Matthew 18, 16 says, If he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may, may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. The, the idea that witnesses need to happen is, is so important to our understanding of truth. It attests to truth. So Jesus attests to truth. Jesus says in John 5, 30, I can do nothing on my own as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another one who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony he bears about me is true. Uh, You sent to John, and John has borne witness to the truth. So we see him, we see Jesus verifying who he is based on the witness of others. John said, Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus says, there is witness. Another witness that he uses in the same passage is Moses. Moses says this is to be expected. God called his shot that the Messiah would come. And, and so we see this. Jesus is saying, the witness is true of me. How does this prepare us for the presence of God? All of these things about Scripture, we have to understand that Scripture gives us the foundation for us to get to the truth. Scripture is our foundation. It's not the media. It's not my perception. It's not my chosen identity. It's not my whatever perspective I have. It is Scripture. And Scripture is written as the story of God. The story of God that takes me through this revelation of God for multiple generations. If, if, if this is the God that we believe in, then we have to say that it's important for us to be established in an understanding of Emmanuel. When I put my faith in God, my faith is informed by God's past action. It's not a floaty ideal of like, oh, I'm going to meet God. No, it is formed in God's past action. I put my faith and my trust in the truth of Scripture We have to take it seriously because if this God is real, then he has to be larger than us, which means I can't get it all just from my own short span of life that I have. I have to rely on the stories of others. If God is actually real, we can't make gods in our own image. We can't just be like, oh, well, this is what I want God to be like. Doesn't work. That's empty. God is promising to be with us, the real God. We can't afford to reduce God to our perception. It's got to be based in history. If you want to know God, you have to actually read the history of God and allow his actions to inform what God is doing now. You have to. We can't detach ourselves from the history of Scripture 
and expect that the God that we come up with is the God that revealed himself and took so much care and so much time to invest in humanity. We've got to go back and we have to say, here is our foundation for truth. From there, all other truths can be built. All other realities, all other constructions, all other pieces of society, they can all be built from the foundation that God has revealed himself. People have faithfully recorded God's action. We have trusted it for thousands of years. And there have been many witnesses, much evidence, to say this is the authority. All of it culminates in Jesus' statement when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody can come to God except for through me. This isn't the arrogant statement of an individual. This is the culmination of thousands of years of history of God calling his shots until one day he stands among other people as a person incarnate and says, I'm the way. Know me. You cannot know God without knowing me, and you cannot know me without knowing God. These three remain, the word of history, the word of witnesses, and our current testimony. God is still acting This very God that acted here, and we closed the canon, we closed it and said, this is what we're sure of. But God is still acting today, and we know that God is acting today because he's faithful. And so when we see the same types of things happening in the Bible as happened today, we know that the same God is behind it. And so we know and we trust. We answer this crisis in our day, not by trying to wade through it with our own philosophies, but by rooting ourselves in the truth of Jesus. We root ourselves in the revelation of Scripture. And it's when we do that, we can be prepared for God's presence. It's so important that we actually do this and take it seriously. And I thank you for joining with us today. I'm going to pray that God increases your hunger for Scripture. God, I thank you. I thank you for your persistence. I thank you that you intentionally spent thousands of years to show us your character. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that is consistently working on the same trajectory of showing yourself to us. And God, right now we get caught up in a day where people are unsure of what truth is. In that, I pray that you would increase our desire for Scripture, something sure, something true, something that I can anchor my life on on. God, I pray that we would be able to give the testimony of thousands before us, that we'd be able to give it the credibility that it deserves, and that we would allow their voice to introduce you, Almighty God, to us. Through this, we pray that that the truth, Jesus Christ, would be revealed in great ways to each one of us that we too would join the story of how you're showing yourself to all humanity. God, I thank you for your presence and I thank you for your investment in us. Help us be faithful respondents. Give us a hunger for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being a part of Promise Church. And thank you for, for following along with how we get to the authority of Scripture. I hope that you enjoy reading it through that lens. God bless you. We'll see you next week.